Então agora estão agora estão se ver aqui, olha, Bela. Agora estão se ver aqui no. no... Não, eu Ai, baixo, eu aproveitar não, enquanto não, estamos não, a falar em português oi. a todos. Luciana, é como um beijo. A Jacqueline. É, a Jacqueline é uma surpresa, eu vou explicar. Então, enquanto we should, estamos em we português. Should, we have better speaking English, isn't it? So... We will, we will, but we have a, an extra guest, but that's okay, because me and, and Susana are going to do the translating. It's a, it's a surprise. I'll, I'll let, just, let's just see if everyone is in. And then we will. Então, mas we'll é isso. Manage. Vamos falar em português um pouco ainda enquanto não entram. Sim. Uh, oh, que... Jacqueline, olha, eu quero dizer da minha parte, muito obrigada por você ter uh, acedido a estar aqui também. Isto, a Susana já lhe deve ter explicado: o World Council of Anthropological Associations é uma associação internacional com associações de antropologia de todo o mundo. E justamente o webinar de hoje é sobre direitos humanos e foi expultado pela vontade da Bela e infelizmente por todas as atrocidades que têm sido cometidas no Brasil e nomeadamente na Amazónia. Por isso é que foi também tão interessante ouvir a sua palestra hoje de manhã, que está completamente ligada a isto de hoje. Portanto, eu vou apresentar os, os vários palestrantes e vou falar também de si e depois... Quando a Susana falar, eu vou-lhe passar também a palavra e se você quiser dizer alguma coisa, eu e a Susana traduzimos, está bem? Porque o resto do pessoal não vai entender, quer dizer, a Bela ou o Luiz e eu vamos entender português, mas o resto do pessoal não, está bem? Quem é? Muito obrigada. Quem é? Muito obrigada. É a Jaqueline. Jaqueline? Jaqueline. É, a Jaqueline é Guarani Caiuá. Olá. E, e deu uma apresentação there agora. Are people. Sorry, there are already people here. We don't okay. Understand. Okay, we got... That's okay, that's okay. I was just... Uh, Virginia, I don't worry. You know, I understand. I it's we will switch. It's, it's we will switch to English now. I just wanted to welcome Jacqueline. I'll explain in a few seconds I, when we start. Let me just check just if everyone it. is here. I think everybody is here. But... Okay, Louise is here. PJ is here. Annapurna is here. Susanna is here. Belle is here. Yeah. So I think yes, we can start. So just one second, please. Okay, so I think we, we can start. It's, uh, it's 2 p.m., isn't it? Yeah, uh, three minutes past. So I think we should start. So good morning, good afternoon, good night, everyone, depending on where you are. This is our 16th um, webinar, WCA webinar. Actually, it is now a WOW webinar. WOW is the World Anthropological Union. And it's formed of two chambers, WCA, World Council of Anthropological Associations, and IUAES, the International Association, um, Anthropological Union, Anthropological and Ethnological Society. So what happens is that we've been organizing this webinar since the beginning of, well, since April 2020, when the pandemic started and people were not able to to get together. So actually, this uh, WCA started this webinar as it was one of the first associations probably to start webinars. And we've been continuing this tradition. It is now, as I said, a wow um, webinar. All the webinars, all the previous webinars are available in our website. You are more than welcome to watch them and diffuse them to whoever you want to. We have had always different topics with colleagues from all parts of the world. This 16th webinar uh, was, um, it, it started as an idea from our colleague, Bella Feldman Bianco, who is here present from Brazil. And unfortunately, the topic came about because, well, the topic came about because of unfortunate events. That's what I mean to say, because of all the atrocities um, being committed in Brazil, the murder of two, um, two persons in, in, in the Amazon area. And, and this is actually what kind of gave us the idea that it was really urgent to have this webinar on this specific issue. Uh, and that is also the reason why the Brazilian presence here is so strong today. Because unfortunately, Brazil is one of the countries touched by this um, total a violation of human rights. Unfortunately, it's not the only country in the planet. 
as we know. So before we start, I want to thank all the participants whom I will present in a few seconds, but I also want to thank uh, Michel Bouchard, our colleague from the WCA organizing committee from the University of Northern British Columbia, who always makes this technologically possible. And also Ricardo Faguagua from Mexico, our colleague who is also a, a an IT technician. I, I'm terrible with IT, so I really thank them for making this possible. This is being broadcast alive in, um, in, through our Facebook, if I'm not wrong. And as I said, it will be also available on the WOW uh, website. Now we have today four um, speakers uh, from different countries, and we also have an extra uh, EVT, an, an extra participant, and I will explain you in a few moments who that is. Um, well, I will start presenting the, the speakers. Uh, just give me one second here because I need to, to move from this. Um, oops, sorry. So we have, we, it was, you know, it was very difficult to to get Brazilians this time, although, like I said, it, Brazil is one of the topics, but as you know, on this weekend, there will be a very, very important event for not only Brazil, but I think for all of, of us in the planet, which is the elections, the upcoming elections for president in Brazil this weekend on the 2nd of October. So everybody was really busy with, uh, not only with academic work, but also, engaged political work, but we do have some of our very important um, Brazilian fellow colleagues. I will start presenting on a logic from, uh, well, from, as I always do, from east to west. So the first person that I will have speaking will be our colleague PJ Isaac uh, from Nigeria. And, and PJ, is a professor at the University of Nigeria, Nzuka. I hope I'm saying it is correct. He's a fellow of the Royal Anthropological Institute of UK and Ireland. He's also the president of the Ethnological and Anthropological Society of Nigeria. He's a fellow of the Pan-African Circle of Artists. And he basically works on communication, uh, having studied both Oring and Koring languages, uh, two native languages from Nigeria. But he has also worked a lot and published on qualitative methods. One of his books, uh, which is already in the third edition, is called um, Methods in Qualitative Research. And he, th this has been um, published together with a colleague, Pat Uk Okpoko. And um, PJ is also a fellow colleague from this um, organizing committee of WCA. Then we will have Susanna Dmach Viegas. Uh, Susanna is um, an anthropologist, a researcher at the Institute for the Social Sciences of the University of Lisbon. She has done fieldwork among indigenous people of Brazil and Timor Leste. And she works on topics like place, land ownership, indigenous transformation personhood and kinship. She has also been a consultant for the FUNAI, um, the, found the Indian Foundation in Brazil, in the process of recognition by the Brazilian federal state of the indigenous territory of the Tupinamba of Olivença. She's also starting a, a program on land uh, belonging um, in circumstances resulting from new climate climate regime, and she's also the editor-in-chief of the PT Journal of the Society for the Anthropology of Lowland South America since February 2022. Moving on to our Brazilian colleagues, uh, Bella Feldman Bianco is a, a PhD from Colombia. She is a professor of anthropology at the State University of Campinas, and her research and publication have focused on culture and power with emphasis on migration and displacements in comparative perspectives. She is chair of ABBA's Committee on Migration and Displacements and a counselor at the Brazilian National Council on Immigration currently. So besides that, Bella Feldman Bianco is also our colleague at the WCAA uh, organizing committee and she has put together exactly um, 
a panel, actually a round table, a seminar, a symposium, it's called, uh, in the last uh, ABBA Congress, which took place in late August, exactly on the same top topics that we are going to be discussing today. Then uh, Luis Fernandes Dias Duarte is a full professor in the Department of Anthropology at the National Museum, the one that burned a few years ago, as you know, of the University of Rio de Janeiro. He has dealt mostly with the analysis of personhood involving religion, family, and sexuality in his work. And uh, currently his work concerns the presence of romanticism and vitalism in anthropological thought. He's also a member of the Brazilian Academy of Sciences. Then we will have our colleague Anapurna Devi Pandi, who uh, teaches anthropology at the University of California, Santa Cruz. She is uh, a sociologist and social anthropologist, and she has a, a postdoctorate in social anthropology from Cambridge, UK. But her research interests are on diaspora studies, South Asian religion, and immigrant women's identity making in the diaspora. Uh, most recently, her research has been focusing on struggles and challenges of H-1B and H-4 visa holders in the context of the pandemic, visa holders for the United States event, obviously. And she she's the author of numerous articles and book chapters, chapters on rural and tribal women's activism, agency, entrepreneurship, and empowerment in India and the uh, Indian diaspora. She's also a filmmaker. And her most recent film, Road to Zuni, has received multiple national and international awards. Now, uh, so we have these four speakers, and now I want to introduce our extra um, special, which <laughs> just came about. And it, I think it's lucky for us to have today here with us Jacqueline Gonçalves Porto. Uh, her, um, she is a Guarani Kaiwa um, indigenous woman. Her, so her indigenous name is Kuna Anaduha. I'm probably not saying this right. And she's doing her PhD at the Universidade Federal de Grande Dourados in Brazil. She has, uh, she presented this morning a very interesting uh, talk on the agro patriarchate and how the Guarani and Kaiwa women in Pará, in, in Brazil, face and challenge and fight against all these problems and how women suffer from rape, uh, extortion, uh, how the Guarani and Kaiwa are being persecuted by various religions, mainly evangelical, but not only in Brazil, and how also from an agro capitalist point of view, they have also been exploited and their land and rivers have been poisoned by mercury and other, um, other, uh, other plagues and other um, elements that pollute and kill both the fauna and the flora. So she is together with Susanna and uh, I will let her speak for a few minutes when Susanna uh, talks and I will, me and Susanna will translate since um, since Jacqueline uh, speaks Portuguese. So I will start now and I, will I want to thank once again everyone for being here today um, and I will start now with, um, with our colleague from Nigeria, PJ Isaac. Each one has uh, about four or five minutes, and then we move on to the next one as we normally do in these webinars. So that means that we have two turns. Each speaker will have two turns to speak, and then we'll open the floor for discussion to the wider public. So mm. PJ, please. Uh, I want to thank you, Clara, for the opportunity and uh, honor of uh, participating in this very important event. Uh, I think I should seize uh, this opportunity to also congratulate you because uh, WCA may have uh, owned the webinar, but I wonder if we could have achieved it without your untiring efforts. 
So that innovation, we owe a lot. Indeed, the world of anthropology owes a lot to you in it. So having said this, uh, I want to underline that uh, we in Africa, at least in Africa, uh, anthropological community feel um, very sad. We mourn, we share the horror of uh, what uh, you have mentioned, the atrocities against um, uh, our co-scholars in, uh, in Brazil. But I have to say that if we limited it to uh, the Brazilian issue, um, I would have been a happy um, participant in the sense of uh, hearing what others would say. I think uh, where I feel I have a bit of knowledge and expertise will be on the subject of uh, human rights itself and uh, how the knowledge or understanding of uh, human rights affects Africa, which is the place I practice. Yes, such heinous crimes as uh, restricting the freedom of uh, whoever it is, anywhere in the world, or indeed going to the uh, uh, horrendous extreme of uh, taking that person's life is bad enough. But uh, when anthropology looks at uh, human rights, I think it should be defined to include such acts as well as others, which I think is not usually included when we discuss uh, the issue of uh, human rights. Here in Africa, you find that some issues that should be included are not included because the definition of a uh, human right seems only to focus on what the interna such international uh, uh, organizations like the UN and the uh, African Union lately, perhaps some other bodies like that, which is drawing from 1947 Declaration of Human Rights. And um, often because of our experience here, I do go back to read this. And I found that the ideas expressed there or the engine that drives the intellectual engine that uh, drives uh, such um, ideas are the ones drawn, drawn from the Greco Roman political theories. But I think locally here, we, we have a whole number of issues that should also be included. Um, my coming into anthropology actually originated from what I saw happening to the group uh, that I ended up studying for my PhD. N namely, when the parliament of uh, one of the constituent states of Nigeria uh, called Anambo, were debating whether or not to include the language of uh, this particular group, uh, the Oring, among the ones the local radio station and the TV should broadcast in. The member of parliament 
representing this group in the legislature, indeed, were persuading his uh, colleagues that that language should not be included because these people were not important. And why were they not important? Not that anybody was disputing their humanity, but that they are in the minority. Indeed, he traced a very curious history that of course had um, since been shown not to be accurate, saying that these people were a conquered people in the past. So the major, the language of the encounters were the ones to be promoted, not their own. And of course, having had that and not being anthropologists at the time, I said the discipline that will help me to understand the truth or falsity of this should be to become an anthropologist. I did. And of course, uh, many of these claims that the man made were shown to be wrong. And uh, sometimes when we talk about uh, human rights violation or observation of, of it, it seems that the general notion or approach is to use, if you like, Western templates to look at it. Take, for instance, the issue of women. The average article you read or publication you read present a picture. PJ, that I don't want to interrupt, but you, you are over your five minutes. So if you could wrap it up, you, you will be yes, able to speak. I will wrap it up by sorry. saying, I, yes, I will wrap it up by saying that if our participation in promotion of human rights will be authentic and respected by history, then we should continue in the known tradition of anthropologists, which tends to look at things from the viewpoint of the host society and not bring template from outside to impose on the host society. The, the topic definitely Clara is too complex than uh, five or four minutes uh, can handle, but I do apologize if I overshot, but we certainly need uh, longer time to be able to address it. Anthropology, continue with your classic condition of coming from the inside of the society that we are dealing with. Yes, they are some issues that seem to cut across all humanity, whatever their local ethos may be, e.g. the issue we are looking at regarding the Brazilians. I'm yet to meet any human group that say that um, killing of others just for holding a different point of view is correct. None does that. So there are issues like that but there are zillions of others where the views of the local community must come first. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much, PJ. Yes, I, I, I apologize, but I really need to cut your word yes, in your tone I, because I, I, understand I, I, under, I understand that, yes, of course, all these issues always in our webinars are issues that we could you know stay for hours talking about discussing right. debating but the format of the webinars is a very informal quick things where people throw in ideas and then we debate that that's the idea I'm, Jay. I'm, I'm so, very much no no yeah. and and the, the other thing i wanted to make clear also is that 
Uh, the reason I mentioned Brazil and that we do have uh, two uh, colleagues from Brazil instead of just one from that country is, is really because this was uh, the idea came from our Brazilian colleague and because in Brazil, unfortunately, lately things have been so rough. It does not mean they have not been in other countries by no means. And uh, actually, the idea is to have two webinars on human rights. So it's like due to the proximity of the Brazilian elections also, we thought that, you know, anthropology should try to help in yeah. trying to get Bolsonaro out of the Brazilian government, since, as we all know, he is unfortunately not a, a good person as far <laughs> as the theme of human rights is concerned, by no means. So we thought that it, it would be important to have Brazil on the hotspot, because this is a hot time for Brazil right now. But anyway, I yes, we, have, we will have a second webinar with that. colleagues from other countries as well, just like we have you and we have Annapurna uh, today. And once again, I thank you for accepting. But I will now pass on the word to Susana Viegas, our colleague from Lisbon who has also worked in Brazil. And with her, as I said, is Jacqueline, um, an indigenous um, colleague, uh, Guarani Kaiwa. And so I give the word to Susanna and then hopefully Jacqueline will be able to tell us also one or two things, uh, whatever she wants to say, and me and Susanna will gladly translate. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Clara and everyone. Um, hi from Lisbon. Um, yes, I'm going, in, in actual fact, what I'm going to do is to publicize something which is a kind of a political act from the Association of Anthropologists who work with indigenous people in lowland South America. I am currently the editor-in-chief of TPT, which is the Journal of Salsa, that association. And we're going to publish uh, next week uh, the first volume uh, in which I am uh, the editor-in-chief. And we have a book forum, which is actually a political act. And it is book forum uh, uh, on uh, uh, a book that has been published in Portuguese, Portuguese and this book forum is in English. Um, it is a, a book organized by Manuela Carneiro da Cunha, uh, Sonia Magalhães and Cristina Adams. And it is on the difficulties of the enforcement of territorial rights in Brazil. And so the book forum in, in, in fact actualizes the data uh, showing how the recent government has uh, made a catastrophic uh, um, in terms of the territory and human rights in Brazil. And if we, in fact, we start with a, with a short contribution by Samara Patasho, who is a lawyer and anthropologist and indigenous uh, person, uh, woman. Um, and we have a contribution also of uh, um, an, an article by Beatriz Bat Matos, uh, Miguel Aparicio and Fabio Ribeiro. Beatriz is the widow of Bruno uh, Pereira, who has been killed and was a colleague of ours, and he has been killed exactly in, uh, in the defense of the, particularly of the indigenous uh, isolated groups in Brazil. So he was a member of the Observatory of Human Rights and isolated from isolated indigenous people. And the contribution of them is exactly to show the violence which is quite invisible um, that has been made by the government also to self-determination of the isolated indigenous people. So it's not only the very visible um, violence uh, and, and, and and against human rights that um, that Jacqueline can tell us about because the Guarani Kaiwa have been always recognized international since ever, even before this government as uh, one of the most, um, uh, one of the, the, the regions where genocide has been made uh, against indigenous people in Brazil. And now what has happened in the last three months after the killing of, uh, of, Beatri of, of uh, Bruno Pereira and Don Phillips, what has happened is uh, the government itself killing indigenous people and feeling legitimized to do that. So I really think that, so Jacqueline has told us, has talked to us this morning, she's representative mostly of uh, actually women and, and human rights connected with women. 
She's now in Europe uh, spreading the word. It's first the first time that she comes to Europe. So we are very happy to have her here. And I just thought that exactly not only to pay attention to this uh, publication that we're going to, that is coming out next week. And it's an anthropological effort to also contribute to this political fight against, um, uh, against this government in Brazil but also to pay attention to what is happening in the field because we know that uh, the violence against uh, and the violence in Brazil in the mostly in the rural areas has increased imm immensely in the last uh, three months or so. So it's not only that it's a long-term issue, but it's becoming more and more um, difficult. And exactly with the police itself uh, uh, killing uh, indigenous people and not being accused for that. So uh, I organized with Jacqueline that she will just say a few words in this first run. And then in the second run, it will be only her talking and mostly talking about uh, the aspect of women, which is uh, very specific and important at the same time. So Jacqueline. Queres dizer alguma coisa primeiro agora sobre a, o evento de junho? Uhum. Olá, que boa tarde, bom dia, boa noite. O que é traduzir? Uh, good, good morning, good afternoon and good night to everyone. É, obrigada pelo espaço, sou do povo Guarani Caiuá, do estado de Mato Grosso do Sul, no Brasil. Thank you for letting me talk. I'm from the Guarani Kaiwa in Mato Grosso do Sul, the state of Mato Grosso do Sul. Este é um espaço muito importante. Eu estou numa jornada pela Europa denunciando o ecocídio, o epistemicídio, o genocídio dos povos indígenas no Brasil. So this is very important for me because I'm in Europe to spread the words against the genocide, the ecocide and the epistemocide uh, in Brazil. E especificamente o assassinato do nosso povo né, na, na mão dos policiais e fazendeiros e invasões de nossos territórios cotidianamente no Mato Grosso do Sul. E especificamente o the fact that the police has gone uh, has been against us and killing us uh, amongst the Guarani Caiwa uh, in Brazil. E também como as mulheres indígenas têm se auto-organizado frente ao agropatriarcado no Brasil. Obrigada. E também como as indígenas têm se auto-organizado frente ao agropatriarcado, que é uma expressão que ela trouxe para nós também na sua conversa no Brasil. Ok. okay. Well, thank you very much. It was great, and it, I think it's a unique opportunity to have indigenous uh, Guarani Kiowa in this webinar. It was just out of luck that she came to Lisbon and that I had invited Susanna and thought that it would be interesting for you all, for us all, to get to know um, our colleague Jacqueline. Um, so I thank you very much. I will go, move on to our Brazilian colleagues. So let's have Bella first, ladies first, right? <laughs> so let's have Bella Feldman Bianco and then Luis Fernando Duarte. So Bella, you have the floor. Well, I'm, I'm going on the, know. I'm going on, as always, I'm going from the east to the west. So it's not, <laughs> I don't do it alphabetically. I always do it by time zones. <laughs> well, thank you very much for organizing this webinar. Uh, it's time for that. And I want to say first that I didn't expect to be in this webinar, but you wanted so many Brazilians, so I am here, of course. But what I feel like beginning to say is like, not just about Brazil, but about the intrinsic relationship between anthropology and human rights. And human rights, not only in terms of Western notion of human rights, but also in terms of uh, a broader concept of human dignity, because we as anthropologists, we study both Western and non-Western societies, and the concept of human rights is very much a Western concept that uh, was, uh, was produced, constructed at the time in some a very specific juncture after 
uh, World War uh, World War Seconds, and was a reaction, a humanist reaction against fascists, Nazis, racists, and 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 anthropologists and sociologists had a very important role at this time at, in, in the context of UNESCO's projects. In fact, on the um, declaration of race against racism, and also about the idea of, at that time, very humanistic idea after all this uh, terrible uh, uh, period uh, of the unity of mankind, of humanism, humanity of, and of, and very much against racism, against everything that we have now back. So now in, in this conjuncture, we are again, what is happening is not only in Brazil, but is in fact since the um, is the increase of the growth of the far right in different parts of the world. Right now, yesterday or the day before yesterday, we got to know about the victory of the far right in Italy. So the number of far right uh, nation states uh, coming to power is increasing. So it's a very urgent time for us to think as anthropologists again, to have not, a, and also I think when we talk about anthropology, you know, maybe there is a paradox because in the one hand, by anthropologies of at least some anthropologies, and I use the how it's plural, no, uh, particularly those from former empires are just associated with colonialism. But at the same time, anthropology as a discipline evolved, studying the otherness, studying uh, cultural diversity, evolved as a very much humanistic discipline that he is studying what is to be human. This is a singularity of our discipline. And this also brings to the fact that not only we are studying, but we are also, we, we have some social responsibility in terms of our own studies, in terms also of, so, of social action. And I think this is what is happening in Brazil right now, but not only in Brazil, but it, it, that uh, the anthropology and anthropologists themselves themselves are being criminalized and our subjects are being criminalized. And also in a period of change of the very anthropology itself or the composition of anthropologists because it was for many anthropology in Brazil, mainly, mainly white, yeah? mainly, mainly white and now our former subjects are becoming anthropologists. This is the case of our uh, guests here. And, you know, like, uh, and also this is changing this discipline in some ways, I think, and I, I still don't know about that. But in any ca uh, case, what right now uh, with the growth of, of the far right and, and and in Brazil, in particular, the, we are like facing difficult times, not only in terms of indigenous rights or indigenous assassination of indigenous, but I think that also, also that violence against the poor and is not only something that is happening in Brazil, but is happening in different parts of the world in this conjuncture of um, of uh, uh, neoliberal capitalism. And I, I think that this conjuncture of neoliberal uh, capitalism in, in a, and also a very predatory capitalism that, uh, you know, like uh, that um, uh, poor people, like either for urban favelas in, in the case of Brazil, but I can't, I don't, I don't think that it's only about Brazil, uh, uh, but also in, in other countries, that this, this is 
this is pushing the assassination even of 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 uh, of poor people, migrants. Like in terms of even in terms of uh, of of uh, the political uh, the the uh, uh, policies against poor people against that are the criminalization of the poor people. They them refugees or uh, or immigrants in different. Uh, different segments of the population. And this is how also we uh, as anthropologists have this sense of responsibility towards showing, denouncing the situation, is not or understanding the situation, but also looking at, uh, uh, at what is going on at grassroots. And when uh, we talk about in, in, in the Brazilian scene, what we see, and I am writing a paper that I I am, it's difficult to finish uh, about Bolsonaro's period. And what is happening is that, is that as um, he comes with all this um, uh, post political retrocess um, and, um, and, and moral values of the past. Or in heterosexual in every place. But what you see is a, a, since the beginning of his mandate, a construction of political disputes between, uh, between uh, uh, his de decrees and, uh, in, in, and different segments of the population. But, but in terms of uh, 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 political disputes between the policies and different segments of the judiciary, of the legislative, passion by social movements, by civil society. This is always something like defense of democracy that's against what the, 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 the way that um, Bolsonaro and other far right leaders are destroying the democracy from within or trying to destroy the 1988 very democratic constitution based on basic rights. So this is what we are watching. And right now with the elections, I think that we are lucky is really a competition between uh, the sector or this uh, far right and democracy. This is what is in, 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 in the point and now, the fact that we are like okay. in this station was of these results after these okay. very terrible times. All right, Sorry. thank you, Bella. Thank you very much, Bella. I will now pass the word to Fernan to Luis Fernando Duarte from the Museu Nacional, Rio de Janeiro. Well, thank you for the opportunity to talk to you here about this. This terrible uh, question. Um, I, I, I thought I would have two options. The first would have been to depict the present struggle of Brazilian anthropologists and of the Brazilian Anthropological Association against all sorts of threats and crimes against human rights in the country, covering all sorts and varieties of infringements of our most important moral heritage. But I decided uh, to, to say something else. Uh, of course, we must persist in complaining and denouncing and struggling. Uh, but I prefer it to here to bring to the fore in a more general manner, the difficulty anthropology has been facing to deal systematically with the intense, constant and recurring challenges to the enforcement of the conception of humanity and human rights all over the world that are so closely connected to a modern Western conception of, uh, of the world, as has been uh, emphasized by some of the press of the people who preceded me. This is not only a matter of supposedly intrinsic cultural difference, as one might presume to be the case with the Islamic countries, with China, but it happens within the very heart of Western tradition. The USA, for instance, with the Trump symptom, 
it's not only either an effect of backwardness, lack of education, precarious access to the advantages of civilization. This could not account for the recent victory of fascism in countries like Italy or Hungary. And it's not only an effect of sheer new violence, independent of ideological basis and biases. No, the abominable situation of Brazil in present times should be faced in a more ambitious key, taking into consideration a comparative study of these expressions of a resistance or a denial or a refusal or an inversion of our best values, inherited, of course, from the Enlightenment, the Western Enlightenment, and the liberal and rational transformations that are the basis of Western modernity, but that have been able lately, as uh, Bella Bianco has just emphasized, uh, to open uh, to uh, other versions of human dignity uh, present in the uh, whole uh, spectrum of uh, uh, cultural varieties in our world. But how to promote it? Would it, would it be a, 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 to promote this discussion, this a systematic discussion about this, this in, intrinsic difficulties we are dif facing nowadays? in the whole planet no? would be a task would would it be a task for institutions such as wcaa or the wow i would like to participate in such an endeavor there are some examples of some works i remember well Laila abu logo has dealt with in a certain sense vinadas apia in africa but um they're, they're not sufficient yet to really um, face the, the 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 challenge in a intense manner. Well, uh, I, I understand Clara Sarifa is apparently close to the team in her own research, and this is very good. But I think the the, the effort should be more collective and systematic. Thank you. Thank you very much, Luis Fernando. I actually, I do not work on human rights. I, I work on more anthropology of religion and rituals and death. So, of course, it, it has some connections as, as everything. But no, the specialist on human rights here is, I think, more Bella and, and Susanna yeah. and all of you, actually. That's why I got you together to, to speak today. Okay, so we'll move on. Thank you very much for your suggestions. And let's move on to the our last but not least a speaker today, Anapurna Pande. I hope I'm saying it is correctly, um, from India, although she is currently uh, working in California. But from what I uh, exchange with you, all the information, you are working on Indian rights and, and um, Indian diaspora, right? So I give the floor to Anapurna, thanking you once again very much for being here today. Thank you so much, Clara. It is a good morning to all of you from where I am based. I just got back from India, so I may be a little disoriented. I'm sorry. But uh, um, Clara uh, Clara wanted to uh, make sure, and I'm ex I was excited to listen rather than talk. And she said, oh, you don't have to prepare a lecture at all. So, But this has been very, very educational, I must say. Thank you, Clara. Uh, first of all, I would like to say that um, um i would um i uh, am um in you know i'm looking after the human rights commission for, at the iuas so i am making an appeal that please join the human rights commission if we want to bring a change we have to be part of the system so i am making an appeal so let's just work on kind of how we can uh, make it stronger and broaden the horizon and talk about uh, and do collaborative work, uh, bringing in uh, different uh, regions uh, over the world and see what's happening and what kind of uh, uh, change we can really bring. And I strongly believe that we anthropologists can be, and in some ways we should be the activist and we should promote and we should work on bringing a change. So um, I work in India and um, I have been working on indigenous women's movements, uh, protecting their land, mountains, rivers, livelihood and their identity 
especially uh, with the use of their indigenous wisdom. Uh, just to uh, give you a little uh, background that um, uh, 8.6 percent of the Indian population are tribals. When we say tribals, in, in it's a very, very political term because um, in India, everybody defines himself or herself or them as indigenous uh, because the colonization. But we are talking about uh, uh, the way uh, this scheduled tribe has developed with uh, the British, uh, you know, census. So um, and. Uh, in Odisha, where I do my research, and the people who live in the uh, very, very remote interior hills and forests um, that uh, the tribals mostly uh, reside over there. In Odisha, where I do my research, uh, my field work, there are 62 different tribal communities and about 23% of the uh, of 40 million people in Odisha are, uh, are known as tribals. So, um, What's the problem here? That kind of, in what way it's kind of, you know, is the violation of human rights. So the state in collaboration with uh, uh, numerous uh, multinational corporations has been actually engaged in the extraction mining. All these kind of, you know, the, uh, uh, um, uh, the uh, precious metal and uh, the minerals, they are uh, uh, deposited that they're very much found in the mountains and uh, in where the tribals reside. Um, with 1.4 billion uh, uh, population, now India is experiencing massive uh, migration from rural tribal areas to urban especially the young people. And uh, this is the kind of, you know, the model of this, uh, the development. And with this, there has been numerous tribal resistance movements in the context of globalization and development. And uh, just kind of, you know, give us kind of a small example that um, 1.5 million uh, indigenous people have been displaced. And they are known as, they are called that uh, very much that uh, the, mm, involuntary nomads or the homeless people move to because they have gone to slums and they have kind of you know lost their livelihood and their um, um, their identity because how they are tied to their mountains and rivers so one argument i wanted i'm making here that uh, the indigenous people they think of their land as their and the mountains and rivers that as part of them so this is where the important uh, aspect that kind of you know compared to the kind of you know materialist uh, um, and uh, uh, you know uh, very much the binary way of thinking is that this they are part of them. So time to think about use indigenous knowledge wisdom to think that how that land that they have, we have to think of development with the land not against the land. So that with the land, that in the sense that the kind of land is life, land is uh, is kind of you know that uh, um, th that they is uh, the, the identity. Land is the, also the producer of livelihood, and land is the ancestor. So I can go on talking about various uh, groups that uh, I work with. So um, interestingly, that. Uh, people, the, what is happening in these areas, in the tribal areas, the schools are closing. And this is a very, very strategic move the state is making that the schools are closing because more and more residential schools are introduced. Wherever there is a movement, uh, you know, and to protect their land, we see to kind of, you know, first to stop their voice, close down the schools. The teachers are not there, students are not there. And, uh, and uh, interestingly, even with education, many because the state and the multinational corporations are giving so much a bribe to these indigenous people that is creating a kind of a, a, a you know, faction within the community. So some people, when they are fighting, others are supporting the MNCs for immediate pleasure like uh, alcohol and uh, and you know a little bit of money and drugs so on and so forth so i see that sort of kind of you know division is going on and uh, the immediate development vis-a-vis -vis the destruction 
that of their own livelihood and their heritage and their identity. So, uh, and uh, in the name of development that the indigenous people are thrown out of their land, but the wisdom is that here we are, that we work with our animals, with our nature, whatever they produce, the indigenous one, uh, community called the Paudi pa pa Bhuya, that means the mountain Bhuya people, they say they're Paudi from the hills. So they say that, you know, 25 to 30% of our produce goes to the animals. We make sure the animals eat their food and they should not starve. So as a result, because we are always you know, uh, uh, concerned about the well-being of our animals, of our environment, whereas in the name of development, these are the people who have been kind of excluded from their own and they've been kind of denied their right over their own jungle, over their own land, over their own kind of you know, rivers and the minings are cropping up and destroying their livelihood. I'll stop here. Thank you very much, Annapurna. So we unfortunately have the same type of uh, situations, uh, like the same film in India, in Brazil. So two kind of opposite sides of the world. Unfortunately, the scenario is very similar. And so, okay, you all presented in the first round. Now we'll move on to the second round. We will follow the same order. And in the end, we will move uh, to discussion since uh, several of the participants in this webinar um, are writing questions in the chat, which I hope you can all see. Um, we will go into that uh, after we go on a second round, but actually for the second round, um, one thing we can start looking at is exactly at some of the questions or some of the comments that are being shown on the chat. And I think one that is recurrent is the question of whether human rights definition and idea is the same all over the world or not, and whether we should as anthropologists try ourselves to find a definition and a sort of a common ground on what exactly human rights is all about. And of course, this is tremendously difficult, as we all know, as anthropologists. It's also the same type of challenge that we have when we try to, for instance, discuss ethics and ethical rules, because each region in the world has its own specificities. But so um, we have some questions here about that, of course, uh, related to how in the 1940s, the notion of human rights was first codified in a very, of course, particular historical context, as some of you have already mentioned, Bella, PJ, uh, Annapurna. So uh, exactly after two huge world conflicts, worldwide conflicts, and unfortunately, we are now uh, at the verge of, of a possible, let's hope not, but of a possible third world conflict with everything that is going on, not only as far as the indigenous rights uh, and the violation of indigenous human rights and poor people rights and all those rights that are being constantly violated, but also with the big problem now of the, of the war between Russia and Ukraine. So, so we are all living in a world that is facing all sorts of human rights violations. And, and so I think it's very pertinent that, for instance, one of the persons writing here, um, one of Virginia's students mentions that, says, you know, but, but so what are human rights? What, what, what are we as anthropologists um, defining or standing for when we talk about human rights? So leaving this, this question and this comment in the air, I will move on to the second round. So PJ, please, I, I do um, ask you all to respect the five minutes, more or less, as some people will really have to leave around 20 to five. And this webinar is normally last one and a half hour, not more, because otherwise it's too long to be watching a screen, you know, watching people on the screen. So please, PJ, you have the floor. PJ, can you hear me? PJ, are you frozen? You're in Nigeria, you're not like to, to be frozen. It's it's too warm, but PJ, can you hear me? Hello. 
Okay. Uh, well, he's gone now. He was here. Okay. Perhaps he's having. Perhaps he's having technolo technological problems. So. I will move on to the next speaker and then we'll go back to PJ whenever he is available again. So uh, Susanna and Jacqueline, please. Okay, thank you so much, Clara. So now it is the floor is to Jacqueline. So she's going to tell us. Um, uh, a proposta né, das mulheres indígenas frente a toda essa política anti-indígena no Brasil, né? Vem muito do reforestar mentes. So she wants to talk about now about the indigenous uh, women and uh, and the problems that result from uh, the lack uh, the the killing of the forest. E trazemos dentro da pauta do reforestar mente a pauta do corpo território, né? onde o nosso corpo tudo que está ligado a nós está ligado à terra e a terra a nós. And what they they discuss is exactly that this is connected with the, the com composition of the land and the body, the territory and the body, uh, that from them they are completely connected uh, and, and it's impossible to disconnect that. Enquanto a proposta neo, do neo-extrativismo segue muito forte no Brasil, a nossa proposta segue com nossos territórios não estão à venda, não são mercadoria. As florestas, os rios não são mercadorias e não estão à venda. So against the proposition of the extractivism and neoliberal extractivism, they they argue that the forests and the rivers are not a commodity, they are not for sale. E tem sido difícil ter um encaminhamento positivo, pois as instituições indigenistas ligadas ao governo federal, como FUNAI e CESAI, hoje estão de posse de missionários e militares. E o problema é que, agora, quando tentam ter o que eles no passado, que foram algumas instituições, como FUNAI, que é suposto ser preserving indigenous rights but uh, but instead they are against them so they have no there is no way in which they uh, they have any anyone in the government or the state or the, that can support them então nessa última semana das eleições no Brasil nós estamos na campanha muito forte para eleger mulheres indígenas dentro da proposta da bancada do cocar dentro do congresso nacional Yeah, so they, the fight of indigenous women these days is to have what they call uh, the, um, how would you uh, translate this, Bella? Bancada do Cocar? <laughs> okay, like a... it, it would be in the parliament, it would be to have uh, a, a line of women, uh, indigenous women. Cocar is the, the head uh, attire that... Uh, Indigenous so people it would be a kind so. of a coalition, a coalition of indigenous women, as yes. as there are other kind of uh, groups of interests that have in the parliament. Involved. In the parliament, so they would be now together and and having uh, uh, and different women are in in actual fact uh, candidates to in these in elections. Porque de acordo com os nossos anciãs, nossas anciãs espirituais, nós somos a última geração que pode fazer algo pelo planeta. So from the point of view of the ancestors uh, and their religious um, ritual performers, they are the last generation that can do anything for the planet. E a, a bancada do Cocar, ela vem justamente apoiando a proposta dos 305 povos indígenas do Brasil. And these, so these women in the bancada do Cocar in the government would be supporting these 305 uh, indigenous people in Brazil. E de 513 deputados, grande parte é a bancada ruralista e a bancada evangélica. Então entramos fortemente esse ano com a proposta da bancada do Cocar, onde colocamos com um número muito alto mulheres indígenas nessas eleições 2022 no Brasil. 
So the idea, the idea is that because they have 513 deputies in the, in the parliament, and they have been organized in these bancadas, exactly in these uh, committees of influence, uh, around uh, agro business and uh, around the the religious evangelists who are also a kind of uh, influence uh, political influence so what they are doing is to say they will have the same kind of coalition with the same name bancada but now the bancada uh, of indigenous people bancada do cocar and mostly indigenous women é, a proposta das mulheres indígenas também dentro do Reflorestar Mente é muito nessa pauta que antes do Brasil da coroa, da coroa ali do que dizem que descobriram o Brasil, existe o Brasil do cocar. So, the, in, this has also to do with reforesting and uh, that uh, even before the, the Portuguese landed in Brazil and, and they said they discovered it, Before that, they already had the bancada do cocar. Então, dentro dessa proposta do corpo território, do reflorestar mentes e da bancada do cocar, é um projeto muito ancestral ali de resistência dos povos indígenas. So this uh, idea of the territory and land together, the reforestation and the bancada do cocar is something that has to do with ancestral Uh, fight uh, amongst indigenous people. E, e tudo isso estamos à frente da maior proposta ruralista, que é a, a proposta da maior privatização dos territórios indígenas, que é a tese do marco temporal. And so they are actually afraid of what may happen if Bolsonaro would still stay in the government, because he has for long a proposition of what is called the marco temporal which was actually, in fact, privatize uh, indigenous land, so they would be able to invade indigenous land. É preciso demarcar os territórios indígenas no Brasil, assim como, como homologá-los. So it's, uh, it's necessary to demarcate and to finish the process of demarcation with the homologation of indigenous land in Brazil. Isso faz com que a pauta dos povos indígenas do Brasil não seja só nossa, mas como de todos. Obrigada. This is why our fight in Brazil for indigenous land is not only for us, but for all of us, mostly women. Okay, thank you very much, Jacqueline and Susana. We've heard Jacqueline's proposal well, directed, of course, at the case of Brazilian indigenous women, but I think it's very valid for uh, a lot of us and definitely it it, it is sort of a symmetrical um, scenario that you and Anna and Purna were, were, were talking about. So let's see if our colleague PJ is back yet. No, I think he isn't. He sent me a message saying he was having IT problems. So let's move on to Bella. Thank you. Thank you. I, it's beautiful. Uh, the idea, the indigenous way and the male's indigenous way of is defining the, the, the uh, um, way of looking at human rights in a way. But I think, I think that the same is happening uh, in Brazil in terms of protagonism of black people like women, and also the way that they construct their bancada also for, for the elections, the way that, you know, the decision to run into institutional politics. Uh, the same thing is happening, like immigrants that want to write it, to vote and write to be candidates. I think that this, this is something that shows, like, that shows how, you know, these different conceptions of personal and of human rights in a way. But also, like when I think about today, and what I wanted to say is that the issue is not only to ask in a, in a hard question, who has the rights to rights? But, uh, no, but also it's like, who has the right to be human? I think this is the main question to, today in this 
a predatory capitalism, I think. But also when we, when we think about the destruction of the Brazilian constitution, I think also we are thinking in terms of fundamental rights. Uh, the Brazilian constitution is based out in terms of you know respecting fundamental rights, the right to, to housing, the right to education, the right of health, this different house. And this is what Bolsonaro's government is doing, is, is the politics of destruction. And I and also I, I think that this is also has to be taken into account what kind of definitions we are using in terms of you know, constitutional rights. And but um, but I think that in fact uh, the human rights concept is just a Western concept. It cannot be universal. This is why I report to human dignity and uh, what is human dignity in different situations. And I don't know if uh, I just to um, uh, so like. I think that it's important to do this, this this discussion, but I don't know if we are going to get to a universal definition of human rights. We can get definitions, pontual definitions, I think more than a universal definition, because even so there is a universal de uh, declaration of human rights, of, but was not a universal. Uh, and also I think when, then there is another question I think that Virginia student make uh, ask, you know, is uh, human rights equal democracy? No, I wouldn't say, and I also would say that when we talk about democracy, there is the symbolic idea of democracy, but when we think in terms of Brazilian democracy, I agree with, you know, Sergio Barco de Holanda that in Brazil, Democracy was a, a big is always been a big misunderstanding because that we always had you know people that are, are have access to power and we are always had, had very much inequality and particularly racial inequality. So there is a struggle, but on the other hand. Uh, is different from dictatorship also, you know, democracy in dictatorship. And what uh, people like Bolsonaro want to do is really to be in charge of everything. And he's advancing, he advanced a lot. Okay. Thank you, ver Thank you very much, Bella. We have a sort of a hot discussion going on in the chat between Mary Hallen, Muggsy, uh, uh, Gordon Matthews, uh, the, the idea is to, to discuss well in the, in the chat uh, whether anthropologists should we throw off from broader common discussions about human rights, if we should be more specific on what we mean by human rights. But well, it's also true what um, Mary Helen has been telling us here on the chat and also Virginia Dominguez said it, which is, for instance, the definition of human rights in the US is very different from the one we have in, in Europe in the sense that, for instance, Mary Helen was saying that some of her students are very amazed when she says that human rights com comprises, for instance, the right to health and to housing. So this basic right that we, we take for granted as human rights in Europe and may not be considered basic human rights in other areas of the world, even within the Western world. So I'll move on now to Luis Fernandez Duarte and then to PJ if he's back. Oh, PJ is back. So please, uh, we, I understood that you had technological problems. So PJ, do you want to use your five minutes now, please? Thank you. You have to unmute yourself. PJ, you're muted. We can't hear you. I'm sorry, we do have uh, technological problems here, uh, but I want to say that uh, mine is a very simple suggestion. Uh, we can't solve this problem from the corner of anthropology by looking for definition. I think once we focus 
on what is properly the task of anthropology, then we, so, we, we will see two things. Number one, anthropology cannot set out to investigate or moderate what happens to human rights as defined by domestic and international state actors. What is the reason? Because the sort of human groups we study have a different strategy for handling issues of uh, people on fair treatment of their members. In my own society, for instance, nobody in traditional setting can anticipate that someone's rights will be deprived because they have it ingrained in their law. For instance, we say ebe bere ugo bere, meaning uh, in English, roughly, leave and let leave. And it's taken seriously. Violation of somebody else's entitlement. And I will use the word entitlement in traditional setting is looked at as a taboo, which shouldn't happen. Now, uh, from late 1940s, 1947, I think we have belabored this already, uh, the world community saw it as necessary to assemble a number of entitlements which should be called human rights. I'm not against that one bit, but the point I want to make clear is that the people in charge of that should be the nation states. Perhaps as anthropologists, if we feel that rights as defined by this uh, new convention uh, is putting someone at a, a disadvantage, uh, well, is being deprived from someone, we may help from the standpoint of applied anthropology. Yes, we can help. Like I said, I actually entered into anthropology as a discipline because I was curious as to why a particular human group should be maltreated. But we must recognize that there are two levels of social organization. One of them is in charge of human rights as defined by the convention that we are looking at. And that actor, like I have said, is the state actor, whether locally or internationally. It is valid if we place it in its proper context. Then there is the other aspect of what human beings autonomously, how they have always protected people, their own members from infringement of their entitlement. I think that is properly speaking, the task of anthropology. We are studying indigenous culture, indigenous people. We now know the way the world has involved. These people are components of a larger segment, namely the nation state, namely international communities. So, if, uh, and if you ask me, properly speaking, the issue of human rights at that level pertains to political science, pertains to legal studies. Our kind of society, the society anthropologists 
are obligated to study have a different moral, a different ethical system. And in my view, we, it may not be easy for us to enter the other territory. Let's focus on our own task, do it very efficiently, and see how we may advise the people concerned with the other moral space. Thank you. Thank you very much, PJ. Also, so we'll move on to Luis Fernando Duarte again, please. Well, the, the discussion has moved fast to me and it's impossible to follow, for instance, the chat that's very rich in, in this moment. Uh, but I would return to the point, the main point of my previous manifestation uh, and say that uh, perhaps we should distinguish between the, the harder uh, concrete effects of violations, transgressions of human rights, which abound so fully as has been described here by Annapurna, by Jacqueline, and by and mentioned also by PJ. But uh, uh, perhaps we, sh we should realize that behind these uh, concrete uh, abominable violations, there is a, an ideology. There is often an ideology. And, and this is what we should uh, face as much as denouncing and uh, trying to defend, of course, in, in, concre in concrete critical situations, the, the people who are uh, being hurt by these violations. But we, we should tackle this ideology, both in the sense of an ideal and both in the sense of ideas. Uh, in Brazil, for instance, the, the, the present situation uh, is sustained by a neo-fascist ideology that has taken hold of the state. Uh, it has its ideologists, its ideolo ideologues, ideologues, uh, uh, philosophers, so-called philosophers. So they, they have, they have uh, uh, arguments about uh, what they are doing. They, they have, uh, they, they, they defend the, 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 these positions from certain uh, points of view. And, and this has to be uh, discussed, understood, and uh, of course, uh, uh, condemned, but from a very critical and reflexive stance and position. Huh? Uh, this, this is in a, in a very general sense, but we have uh, enormous examples, uh, very abundant examples of specific critical situations where the matter of human rights and democracy, as was evoked in one of the uh, one of the the manifestations in the chat, uh, I I thought of one thing that happens in Brazil, but happens also in New Guinea or in Africa, uh, the question of the conversion of uh, small scale societies, conversion to Christianity, or of small scale societies. This is happening everywhere, of course. We anthropologists may well uh, dislike entirely this process and ac accuse, of course, the influence of the, uh, the Pentecost of the Protestant missions that invade these this societies, etc. But there are some of these societies invited the missionaries, so they have the right to choose whether to. Uh, uh, indulge in a, in a, in a vari variation, a variety of Christianity, and to remain in the original, original ideological cultural uh, system. Uh, and this, this is a, challenge, a very difficult challenge. I have colleagues in Brazil that are studying these processes in a, in a very anthropological sense, that uh, respecting the, the, uh, the alternatives, the positions of the study of society. But I have other colleagues that don't want to, to hear about these, these effects. This is a, just an example of the manifold uh, situations that we must face uh, in spite of reaching a global universal definition, which we will never reach in any way. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Luis. As everybody has been saying on the chat, thank you very much. Excellent points, both your idea of ideologies behind the notion of human rights and the violation of human rights, and also how how you just mentioned how it, it will be very hard for us to come to common ground uh, on what exactly human rights is about. But I think that as anthropologists, we, well, as everyone has been saying also in the chat, we have to strive to get this. It's not, I think it's more than a matter of definition, it's a matter of uh, action, right? What, what are our ideas of human rights and how we should fight for this human rights to be accomplished and to be defended and um, respected. So uh, we'll move on now to Annapurna again. Thank you. Yes, um, thank you so much, uh, Luis and uh, the, all the presenters. Um, I um, I just would kind of you know extend upon what uh, Luis just said that um, I think uh, we are we have been uh, talking about democracy. Whose democracy are we talking about? Democracy by whom, for whom, and of whom? So here we are that we have been. Uh, kind of you know, totally uh, justifying, rationalizing in the name of democracy. But I see that it is most, it is the autocracy that's going on and how it is spreading all over the world. So it's the kind of, when we're talking about the dominant ideology, I see it is more the power in the hands of few and this ideology that's kind of in the human greed and uh, uh, the kind of also the, uh, the vested interest of the few and totally at the cost of the people who just kind of you know become who are forced to remain voiceless. So this is also there is also kind of I see that how it is. Think about that kind of if we take even Roe versus Wade. That kind of we are talking about women constituting fifty percent of uh, the world population, but even. 20% of the seats are kind of, you know, the political power is not in the hands of women. And that when women are even in power, you can see how they are scrutinized. They are under surveillance that we are talking about human rights here. So that why a woman's body, why a woman's act, why a woman's expression is constantly under surveillance that if you think about. So uh, uh, this, the conflict between the constitutional rights and the state's assumption or usurping these rights, especially of the indigenous people. Because for example, just let me give you, I know that time is uh, running short, but I just want to give you one example that uh, I work among the indigenous people, the Dongaria Khans in Orissa, and the Dongaria Khans that uh, they won, uh, they, I think they are one of the very few that who won their right over their mountain, Niyamagiri not to do mining. That's what this happened in 2013. They won, uh, the Supreme Court made a decision and uh, they did Gram Sava or they did kind of village council and uh, everybody, all the tribal people kind of you know, were against building this mining. So they won the in the name of their Forest Rights Act because they have their right over their forest. But interestingly, since 2013, the state has been trying, introducing various mining companies and going around the Supreme Court decision, like even uh, uh, branding people, the activists as Maoists, and just taking away their voices so that, and even closing down the schools so that this is a way of gentrification so that they can have the people on their side to build the mining. So whose rights are we talking about here? In kind of, you know, that, and, and then for whom are we talking? Who are we representing? So it is very important to think about that kind of, you know, the human rights in a very, very specific sense and see that how democracy is constantly challenged directly and indirectly. Thank you. Thank you very much, Annapurna. I think you 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 gave us a very nice conclusion, sort of of, of a, sort of a wrap up of what has been discussed. And I think it's been a very challenging webinar because we we have had both very specific 
case studies, <laughs> let's call it that way, as uh, Jacqueline presented us uh, about the struggle of um, Guarani Kaiwa women um, and their activist mobilization, and also the cases you mentioned, Annapurna, and then a sort of a more uh, theoretical, let's say more uh, general discussion on what human rights really is all about and what we as anthropologists should do. And actually, uh, well, in the chat it has been going on and, and one of the things that also came up is the idea that human rights is perhaps a product of the ideology behind modernism. That's what Magzi was saying and, and how democracy is entangled with individualism in our Western society. But exactly like Louise was saying, and he was pointing that out now that, well, it's, it's not always the case because different societies, they have different ways of looking at what is, individual, what is an individual and what is a common ground. So, and, and I think of all the social sciences, we as anthropologists are probably more aware of this, of this uh, discrepancies or, well, I, I wouldn't call it discrepancies, I would call it variety, enriching variety, right? But it also poses a, um, a challenge to, to, for us to be able to face all these differences. So I, I don't know if anyone else wants to intervene, either any of the invited participants, speakers, or anyone in the audience. Please uh, raise your hand or uh, either a real hand or a Zoom hand. Mm -hmm. I don't know if Francesca wants to say something. Oop, Francesca disappeared. Okay. Um, do we have anyone else uh, that wants to say anything else about the issue? Like I said, we will, this will have a second season, <laughs> let's call it that way. This, uh, this webinar on human rights, um, we will can do- Can I add next... something, Claudia, if I, if I okay. can? Sure, um, sure, sure. I, I, I will, uh, I, of course. Go ahead, Susanna. In the Please. sequence of what uh, and what you were saying, and Fernando and Bella, and so uh, the fact that human rights, in terms of international law, has an history that is connected with the post-war uh, world wars, um, that in fact we are witnessing such um, a transformation that it is uh, it's a kind of a post-war but not yet post because we are living in it, uh, that, uh, that, that may probably change completely uh, the kind of uh, international law that we have. And all the contributions here, of course, and in the debate in anthropology are very sensitive to that, to the importance of what Jacqueline was saying as being the body and the, and the land together. So the fact that um, that exactly we need to include in human rights more than humans, um, and 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 I'm sure that we're living in a situation where these changes will will be just necessary. So it's a kind of a revolution that we are living in, right? So so this historical background and the connection with modernity, of course, it of course uh, that which Fernando was also bringing and. Uh, is, is more than important. So we are, we are, we are witnessing a, a revolution that we didn't do yet, yet but uh, anthropology is, is very attentive to that. So that's important there. Yeah. No, I speak. Sure, sure, go ahead. I'm sorry, I didn't notice I was okay. I was muted oh, yeah. myself. Please go ahead, Maxi. Well, I just think that if you're going to have a second round, as you call it, of this, it has to be more than just human rights. The question has got to be phrased around how do anthropologists, something, I, 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 this is off the top of my head, how do anthropologists not only deal with human rights, but how do they contribute to issues in which human rights are central? Something like mm -hmm. that. Yeah. Because it's actually, I mean, I'm, con I'm convinced our concern, I mean, much of what I've written could be read to mean that I'm against the notion of human rights. And I'm completely not. My whole life as an anthropologist in South Africa 
against working against apartheid was use this notion of human rights or very similar kinds of notions as resources to fight that fight. But it's a resource and the, it's the politics and the political economic context in which it all occurs, which is what we've got to address. How do we anthropologists participate in that process? And when do we participate and when not? And I think the kind of madness of neo, I'm going to call it Nazism, that's cutting across the whole of the globe at this point is what we have to address at the moment. That's, if there's any universal in any of this, that's the one for me. It's all over Europe. I mean, Italy's gone mad now. Um, large other parts have. Uh, Brazil, maybe you'll be able to get out of it. America looks as though it's heading back, this, back into a Trumpian era. Maybe not Trump, but... And but somebody else, yeah. Well, yeah, it's yeah. gone crazy. I know. That's yeah, but the, exactly what you oh, were saying, Magzi. Be... Sorry, sorry. Okay, okay. I've done. Oh, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. I thought you had finished. I'm sorry. So yeah, I think that you're what you're pointing exactly right. And you're saying, you know, we need to look at how anthropologists, uh, how do how anthropologists deal not, not only with the ocean notion of human rights, but how how do they contribute uh, in, in different ways in addition in how do they work in issues where human rights are crucial. But I think I think this question that you're pointing out so well has been well treated in in the at least in the in the two examples from our colleagues Anapurna and and Jacqueline in in the sense that yes uh, Anapurna is an anthropologist Jacqueline is a student to become an anthropologist she's a PhD student and she's a, an activist also so it's it's I think exactly two cases where these two anthropologists are are actually using their their know-how their knowledge in anthropology to deal with issues where human rights are absolutely crucial. And, and of course, we can have many more examples from all over the world from fellow colleagues doing this. But the, the, once again, I think this, this webinar had this very good balance of, uh, on the one side, a, a more uh, theoretical uh, and debate, and, and on the other side, the, 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 the very specific point, cases at point, which were very enriching and, and very, I think, easy to, to make us realize how how human rights are are so is such a crucial um issue in in the work we do as anthropologists in the field but anyway yeah we will we will definitely have a second round on human rights other people from other countries will come so uh it's uh it's for oh, it's three thirty eight. yeah francesca, francesca wants to say something so please francesca we can't hear you it's being cut no, we can't. We can't understand a word, Francesca. We can't understand a word of what you're saying. It comes out as just cut, cut sounds. No. <laughs> no, you are sort of mute. Scusa, scusa, non funziona. <laughs> it's not working, Francesca. We okay. can't hear you. Fine. Now we can. Okay. Okay, okay. So I was to just to say something very little because not everything has come true because uh, of the line. Uh, probably in the next round, we, sh we could uh, add something on the communitarian feminisms all over Latin America, because that's something that can have a lot to do uh, with what we are discussing. I guess you agree. Well, I suppose well, since you're Italian, everybody wants to ask you, uh, about Italy, <laughs> right? You can ask yeah, me. We are very, we are issue. desperate. That's issue. We are, no. we are really desperate about what has happened. But I think communication, me, media, and other ones that have, um, have produced this, and also the capacity of a very good opposition and very good campaign. So uh, hopefully, this is not going to really have a real effect. We don't know because. Probably be, as we are in Europe and um, there is need of stability, the government we may not, uh, we, we just don't know what will happen. We hope nothing very dangerous. Yes, Gordon, if you want. 
Yeah, um, Gordon, yeah. please. There is a, a, a problem that we have neglected many areas of the world, particularly East Asia, uh, which needs a lot more. I want people talking about the Uyghurs in China, for example. Uh, I want people talking about Hong Kong. There's other areas of the world that we do need to be talking about human rights and bring them in. Because of yes, course. it's a crucial issue in Brazil uh, and Italy and so on, but let's bring so, in the rest of the world in the next uh, uh, webinar. We, we, we will, Gordon, we will. It's just that, as you know, webinars don't work if there's a lot of speakers. We ha course, can only have yes, four or five course. tops, otherwise it's, it, ta it takes too long. And then, so next time we will definitely have the Far East Asian countries. Well, yeah. thank you very much for this webinar. I think it was really good. And we will definitely go on with more uh, colleagues from different countries. And thank you. And for the Brazilian colleagues, good luck for Sunday. Let's hope uh, you kick Bolsonaro out of the government and Brazil uh, gets back into a democracy. Let's hope for the best. And um, and good luck for you too, Francesca, and to all of us in this crazy planet we're living in nowadays. Thank you very much. And thank yeah, you very I'll much for your Bolsonaro. participation. Oh. Yeah. Uh, thank, <laughs> okay. thank you for effective officiating. Thank you. Thank you, PJ. Thank you, Anna Puna. Thank you, Susanna, Bella, Luis, and thank you all. Thank you. Yeah.